Great. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephen O'Brien. So Dr. O'Brien is an alumnus of St. Francis. Uh, he was a Christian graduate in 1966, I believe it's right. From there, he went on to get his PhD at uh, Cornell University and has been working in the field of genomics ever since. He, was, um, uh, he worked at the National Cancer Institute as chief of, I forget the name of the department, um, human evolution and genetics? Genomic diversity. Genomic diversity. And then um, more recently established the Dansky Institute, which is a genomics research institute uh, uh, centered out of St. Petersburg, Russia. Um, <coughs> Dr. O'Brien has been extremely kind with his time. He's going to be spending basically most of the rest of the semester with us and giving two lectures a week. He also has invited several other uh, colleagues of his to come in. It's a, it's a tremendous gift and we're very, I'm very excited uh, for this lecture series to begin. So, and I appreciate all of you coming, uh, uh, coming out and, and seeing it. But without further ado, that's, I'm very happy to introduce you. Um, the first talk is about human origins and epi. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you. There's not enough light here for you, is there? This thing? What I'm trying to do is hit the middle somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much for coming. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Um, we kind of conjured up this idea about two years ago when I was visiting here, uh, St. Francis, because I have a soft spot in my heart for the school. Um, uh, I, I've said, I don't mean this in a pejorative way, but I've said several times that I went to a little school in Pennsylvania that nobody ever heard of, and it's right in the middle of nowhere. And actually, many people said they had heard of it, often for the basketball, but other for other reasons. And <clears throat> I always felt good, because when I started here, I had no idea where I was going or what I wanted to do. Um, and the transition that the professors here were able to offer to me was uh, mixed. Some of them were wonderful and some of them were not. And the ones that were very wonderful made a big difference. So what I'm going to do in this lecture series is try to go through uh, how the field that I chose, which was genetics, back 50 years ago has mushroomed into a field that everybody thinks they do if they do research now, because DNA is part of everything. Um, <clears throat> there's 10 lectures altogether and four guests. Um, and basically, each lecture is meant to be a standalone narrative about aspects of life uh, that really affect us all, from natural history to medicine to bioethics to forensics, even to translation in through agriculture and other kinds of things. The stories have been told not just by myself, but in the popular media, in the news, and magazines, and TV, and even a few got into the movies. We will use those visual accessories a little bit to bring some of these stories to life. That is, you don't have to listen to me 100% of the time, but 99% of the time and a little bit of movies. Um, the hope is to really create a series that will demystify science discoveries of the genomics era to specialists and non-specialists alike uh, through curious and critical uh, <coughs> discussion of rich examples of biotechnology and improvements and applications. Each story has a beginning, middle, and end carefully selected to review how bioscience and genetics can change our lives, our society, and our future. And the stories are all true, carefully researched and rich with real life adventures that present examples of detail of how genetic foresight and innovation unravel the truth about the shadowy past of human ancestry, a long time the wondrous creatures with whom we share our planet. Now. 
Oh, we never got the lights down, did we? Okay. So, first of all, a little overview about what it is you'll learn, and that's sort of the lectures that I will be presenting are actually, I think, 10, but I could only remember eight when I wrote this slide. The first one is about inspections and, 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 and searches into prehistory about the human migrations that led us to where we are today. There's a lecture on the wonder of how molecular evolution and DNA studies of genome patterns of variations and transmission have influenced all kinds of things in medicine, biology, and other things. I'll give you some examples. How genomics has been translated from an academic field into applications with respect to many of the endangered species and how it's been applied. Um, how genomics has unraveled one of the most interesting aspects of our history, which is domestication, the time around 10,000 years ago when hunter-gatherers settled down to, <coughs> shall I say, farming and using plant species and animal species as levers that could be bred together for human betterment. And it has been called one of the most important things that happened to move civilization. I'll talk to you about how genomics has influenced some of the great plagues across so many years. I'll talk to you about mechanisms of studying adaptations that occur in certain species that can translate into biomedical uh, treatments for human maladies which are untreatable. I'll talk about uh, a couple of epidemics that have been cured through genomic studies. I'll talk about applications of genomics to forensic cases, how murders and rapes right now almost never get adjudicated without a genetic uh, DNA matching uh, complement. I have invited a few of my friends to come and talk. One is Dr. Lori Goodman who is basically the editor of a biotechnology journal called GigaScience in Hong Kong. I asked her to talk about bioethics and policy and also about ways in which women have a great opportunity in science today. David Wilt is the director of the uh, <coughs> Facility for Conservation Research at the National Zoo of the Smithsonian. Uh, he's an old friend and he's going to come up and talk about how captive populations play into conservation from a reproduction standpoint. Ann Schmidt Kunzel is the uh, director of the genomics program at the Cheetah Conservation Program in Ochivarango, Namibia in southern Africa, which is an on-the-ground application of real-time science to protecting cheetahs and the other individuals in that area. John Gearhart is from the University of Pennsylvania. He's an old friend. He's the fellow who discovered the original human stem cells and described them, which has, of course, turned into a great medical advance. He's a very colorful speaker, and I know you'll enjoy all four of these people. They're coming here at great expense uh, because St. Francis isn't paying them anything, but they're staying up at the house where I'm at, and they're friends of mine, and they're, they're excited to come and see all of you. So I hope you have time to see them. I'm going to start by saying that this is about uh, <coughs> science applications in the genomics era. And I will also mention that when most of you were born, the word genomics was only a couple of years old. I want to tell you how it started. In those days, we were <coughs> mapping genes in Drosophila and in mice and in other species. And there was a community that was dreaming about human genetics that got together every year at something called the Human Gene Mapping Workshops. And in this particular one, it took place in Bethesda in 1986. And it, what we did is we could get together and they break the people into groups. There would be a group that was concentrating on chromosome 1. And then there was another group that cared about chromosome 2. And a third that cared about chromosome 3. And then in the back of the bus was the comparative group that was thinking about animals and comparative genomics, which is something I'll talk about in a later lecture. Anyway, there was a new journal that was being thought of by 
a publisher called Academic Press. And they had asked myself and a bunch of other people to help them organize this. And at the time, I was working as a laboratory director, which is like a department chair at the National Cancer Institute, when genetics was really starting to blossom from being an area that was just counting chromosomes to an area which was understanding DNA and was even dreaming about sequencing not only the mitochondria but the whole genomes. Well, <clears throat> we got tired of sitting around in these meetings and we went to a local bar on Georgetown Road called McDonald's Raw Bar in order to talk about a problem we had. This new journal was going to be about the analysis of full genomes. It was going to be the analysis of human genomes, of animal genomes, of comparative work, of population work, of medical work. And we needed a name for it. There was already a journal called Genetics, and there was, an article, art, there was already a journal called Genome, and we didn't know exactly what to call it. However, after a few beers, one of the guys, the people at the table were this guy, Tom Roderick. Tom was a mouse geneticist from the Jackson Laboratories in Bar Harbor, Maine, who had done a lot of work on developing strains of mice that were good for mapping and inversions and things like that. Then there was Jim Womack, who was, uh, grew up to be the director and leader of the Bovine Genome Project, sort of the person who put genomics into the cattle industry and to making beef better using genetic applications. And the third person was a human geneticist named Tom Shows from uh, Roswell Park in Buffalo. He was basically mapping genes with somatic cell hybrids, and one of the people that actually taught me how to do that when we were mapping genes at NIH, genes like the oncogenes and the retroviral integration sites and the things that were exciting in cancer research in those days. So I thought we should call the journal New Journal Genome, but the, it was a, a problem which Tom brought up. He said, you know, there's a Canadian journal of cytogenetics and genetics. And they don't like that name, so they just changed the name to Genome. And I said, oh, heck with them. We just do it. This is important. He said, you can't do that. You have to respect that they already got it. And so we thought about a bunch of names. And then finally, he leaned over, Tom did, and he said, well, I thought of something, that a word I never heard before. You probably haven't either, but maybe we ought to try it. He says, how about genomics? It's the first time we'd ever heard that word. And it was basically, all of a sudden, sounds a little funny. But the truth is, after a few days, it sounded better. And the journal became genomics. It was led by Victor McCusick, who was a major uh, human geneticist at the time, considered by many the father of human genetics, from Johns Hopkins and Frank Ruddell who was one of the preludes to the Human Genome Project, mapping a lot of genes with somatic cell hybrids and fancy methods. He was at Yale. And that journal, Genomics, is still out there. And uh, that's how the word got started. So now that you know that, you'll know that it wasn't much after that when the people who were doing human genetics and doing genetics, for example, were thinking, well, you know, we know a lot about human hereditary diseases, and we know a lot about Drosophila genetics, we know a lot about corn genetics, and so forth. But you know, we now have technologies and machines that use technologies that were invented in the 80s to sequence the actual letter code of DNA. And if you do the calculations on the back of an envelope, it is possible, if we have government support, to sequence the whole genome. To make a long story short, there was a big bunch of fights between people who said, what do we want to do that for? What are you going to get? You're just going to get a script that nobody will know how to interpret and anything, and it'll take money away from us because we're trying to work on our Drosophila or our yeast or whatever bacteria. Nonetheless, the, hum the, 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 the profits of how wonderful genetics is going to be with the whole genome sequence prevailed, and the NIH and many other countries put a total of over two billion U.S. dollars into sequencing the human genome. They got a half a dozen volunteers from different places across the U.S. to donate their DNA, and then they began the sequencing in about 
1998. Here was the promise, and you hear this all the time, about what are the things that it's going to do. And we started building these things up in the 90s, and they keep talking about them. First of all, it's going to develop a field called pharmacogenomics. That it is done, where the genotype of individuals are assessed to determine their differential sensitivity to certain drugs. Talents will be determined by genetics. Maybe we'll be able to discover genes that influence that. Forensics, be able to use it, use the variation that we find in order to apply it to forensic cases. Archaeology, searching human history. That's what we're going to talk about today. Disease monitoring, agriculture, regeneration of limbs, geriatrics, brain and neuroscience, personalized gene medicine, ancestry like 23andMe. All of these were promises of the Human Genome Project. And in 2003, the human genome sequence for the second time, first one came in 2001, but in 2003, the draft sequence of the human genome was published simultaneously with fully occupied issues of nature and science. The nature one was uh, essentially uh, um, uh, the, the one that was the so-called public project run by Francis Collins and Eric Lander. And the science magazine was Craig Venter at a company called Solera. They both about the same time announced that they had finished the genome. It was really only 70% of the three billion base pairs, but nonetheless, that was the beginning of it. And there were a number of things that came out of those publications that are interesting, but there's a half dozen of them that are important that I want you to understand. Uh, one was that it was about 2.8 billion base pairs in length from one end of chromosome one to the other end of chromosome 23 in humans. It had, at that time, about 24 to 30,000 predicted genes based upon models of how you find a gene is an open reading frame with uh, triplet codons that code for amino acids. Only about 2% of the genome was genes itself, coding the genes. The rest of it was non-coding, intergenic. It was intervening spaces in genes called introns. About half of it was repetitive elements that we know about. A number of, of a part of the genome was what are called segmental duplications, which are portions of the genome which don't obey Mendel's laws. Most people have one copy of a gene from mom, one copy from dad. Segmental duplication means some people have three copies of this gene. Others have two, others have five, others have one. Different dosage of the genes there occasionally is associated with a few diseases that became interesting. One of the interesting that we didn't know was that the number of DNA variants, so-called single nucleotide polymorphisms, came out to be approximately 10 billion. And there were databases that would continue to sequence people that would accumulate the 10 or 20 million SNP variants that were done. When it, in 2001 and 2003, it was closer to 6 million. And then these other things aren't so important. But in addition to the things we knew, there were a bunch of things we didn't know. Well, what do the 20,000 genes actually do? Which SNPs regulate which characters? How, where, and why? The genes function. At this time, we only had names for 4,000 genes, and there were 20,000 of them. The names of those 4,000, half of them were probably misnamed because they were just named by the guy who discovered them in the tissue that he discovered them. But there was a lot of them we didn't even have names for. We have names for them all now, but we didn't have them in, that, in those days. How did the genes come to be? Why are they arranged as such? Which genes make us human? Which are critical and which dispensable? which regulatory elements function, and how the SNPs affect them. And what happens when you have a gene that's replicated 50 times, like immunoglobulins or other kinds of genes, like odorant receptors and taste receptors that give you people that can taste wine better than you do, or can smell better than you do, or are interesting from a point of view? Well, one of the things that we knew, and it became clear very quickly, was that we had a lot of things we didn't understand, and most of them would only be approached by taking advantage of comparative genomics or comparative evolutionary genetics. And a 
person whose name I heard first here at St. Francis was this guy, Theodosius Jabjanski. He was sort of like the father of empirical population genetics. He is famous, he died in the 70s. He was famous for a quotation, nothing in biology makes any sense except in light of evolution. When I founded the Institute for Genome Bioinformatics at St. Petersburg, Russia, six years ago, I named it after Theodosius Dubjansky because of his contribution. But I heard his name in Sullivan Hall for the first time about 52 years ago when I read his book, Genetics and the Origin of Species. And this man's influence was pretty important in sort of taking genetics as a population study in integrating population studies with genetics. Nonetheless, a lot of to medicine today and genomics today is predicated upon evolutionary theory and practice. And you're going to hear that out of my mouth a few times as we kind of march through these lectures. <coughs> Before genetics got involved, paleontologists, anthropologists, and linguists were fascinated by the similarities between humans and other animals. And some of them, like Darwin, had the audacity to suggest that <coughs> humans were related closely, they weren't sure how closely, to the great apes chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, and then the gibbet. The anthropological record showed similarities in anatomy and in paleontology that allowed the primate tree to sort out in a way that looked something like this, with the apes close to humans, the gibbons, an outgroup of the great apes, then the old world monkeys, which are the African monkeys, like the baboons and so forth, and the New World monkeys are the owl monkeys of South America, then there's the tarsiers and then the lorises. This relationship was based totally on number of characters that they shared with each other in the bones. And because humans, particularly humans who had religious training, felt that there was a <coughs> something not really acceptable about being really close to the monkeys. Well, you remember the Scopes trial in the 30s, they fought about that because they were teaching evolution. But the point I'm trying to make is that the time of separation between the humans and the apes was considered to be, got to be a long time ago, maybe 18, 20 million years ago. Well, that turned out to be wrong in the 60s. There was a couple of researchers who influenced, okay boss, let's see if we can fix this, I think so, yes. These were important people and I'll mention their name. This is Alan Wilson, he was at Berkeley and he was kind of like one of the fathers of molecular evolution, that is applying molecular studies to evolutionary theories. This is Luca Cavalli Sforza. He was at Stanford. This guy was at Berkeley. This guy was at Stanford in the 60s and the 80s. Luca died maybe three months ago in Italy. He was in his 90s. Alan, well, he got cancer and he died in his 50s back in the uh, early 80s. It's a big loss. But Alan Wilson was the one who sorted out the date that humans were separated from the monkeys. And he did this basically by raising antibodies against serum proteins and then quantitatively measuring, for example, you take human albumin, you put it into a rabbit, you get some antibodies out, and then you measure how strong the reaction was with human albumin. But then if you went to a dog and you took dog albumin, you get a quantitatively amount of less. And then if you went to something in between, like a monkey, it would be halfway in between. And if you went to a chimpanzee or a gorilla, it would be even closer to human. And that amount of quantitative difference was important 
because it reflected an idea that was developed in the um, 60s also by one person who you've all heard of, Linus Pauling and Rolf Zinkernagel. They were the founder of the idea called the molecular clock. The molecular clock says that as <clears throat> genomes or genes or sections of DNA evolve, they accumulate mutations at a time-dependent steady rate. That means if you look at the differences between the same molecule, homologous genes in different species, that the amount of difference is time-dependent so that you have a bit of a chronometer here that you can measure the relative difference between measurements like the one Alan Wilson was making. And then what you do is you can't really calibrate it because you need to have some real time. A percentage of differences in albumin immunological distance is not a date. So the way that they established the dates was the paleontologist helped us here. They had uh, fossils from missing links between these species and then they started to use a, a uh, method called carbon, radioactive carbon decay, which was invented by a guy named Willard Libby in 1949. In 1949, the paleontologists couldn't stand this guy because he was telling them what the age of their fossils were based upon the ratio of carbon-14 and carbon-12. But it, about 15 years later, they couldn't avoid it. Everybody had to do it. So the paleontologists all used the carbon dating. So Alan Wilson took the carbon dating of some known uh, distances between the primates to calibrate it with and demonstrated that the distance between humans and chimpanzees was not 20 million years ago. It was four or five. So it was much closer. So the way the paleontologists viewed things is they had fossils like Australopithecus and Homo habilis and Homo erectus, and they thought there was this linear transition into humans that made a lot of sense uh, that until you had anatomically modern human. Well, that turned out not to be really exactly right. But if you started, for example, with an evolutionary relationship between chimpanzee and human ancestors that were younger than chimpanzees, they came off more like a tree with lineages going off in different directions and calibrated by molecular and also by paleontological data to show that, you know, like 40,000 years ago, the modern humans, Homo sapiens, anatomically modern, shared Europe. Uh, with the uh, Neanderthals. More about that in a minute. Now, I mentioned Luca Cavalli Sforza. He was the founder of something called the Human Genome Diversity Project. He said in the 70s, if we start collecting different modern living ethnic groups across Africa, across South America, across Asia, Africa, uh, Asia, Europe, Russia, and so forth, you're going to be able to have a a, a sort of a Facebook of migrations that can be based upon the idea of the molecular clock. So he started it. He collected people from all these different ethnicities, Inuits, Koreans, Aztecs, Northern Europeans, and began a database and a series of, of uh, uh, blood banks, if you were, DNA banks, bio banks, call them whatever you want. <clears throat> but sadly, Luca ran into a little trouble because he was so excited about his research that he kept talking about it and mentioning these important minority groups and ethnicities and talking about we must collect the DNA from these people before they disappear. Well, nobody wants to hear they're going to disappear. So they got a little offended, and then they grew up and hired some lawyers, and they said, you're not going to get any of our DNA, you guys, because you geneticists, we don't really trust very much. So this is kind of what happened is all of a sudden the Human Genome Biodiversity Project kind of fell out of favor with the rest of the world. It didn't stop, but it fell out of favor. And a lot of the connections between these individuals, the preliminary ones, were given by language, 
where different languages were studied and similarities between the Indo-Europeans and the Africans and the outgroups like the, the sand people in Africa were analyzed and trees were built. And then the molecular guys were trying to build trees that connected these members of these same issues, starting out with this albumin immunological distance, but eventually it grew to include RFLPs, which is a uh, prior way of looking at DNA variants in, in mitochondrial DNA and things like that. Now, if this were a technical class, I would go through it. But next week, I'm going to talk a little more about how phylogenies and relationships are developed. But suffice it to say that four separate algorithms or theories, mathematical-based theories for connecting large number of individuals or species together emerged. And they're all pretty good. They all have strengths and weaknesses. I'll talk about that next week. One of the things that Alan pioneered was to look at mitochondrial DNA, first using uh, RFLPs, which are restriction fragment length polymorphism, but then eventually through sequencing of small sort pieces. The mitochondria is a 16 kilobase molecule, which is a, a cytoplasmic chromosome present in every cell of everybody and every species and every person and everybody. And it evolves pretty quickly, so it's good for recent times. And <clears throat> one of the things that um, Alan Wilson and his colleagues did was to demonstrate that when they compared mitochondrial DNA and built trees based upon similarities, that the, the basically, I realize you can't read it, but these are different groups of ethnic groups in Europe and South America, and this one is Western uh, Eurasia, but the baseline and the one with the most diversity was actually found in Africa. I'm going to show you a better version of this, and this was actually published in Nature back in the 70s when Alan Wilson and, and Becky Kahn, who was the first author, published it. And this tree shows <coughs> a number of different ethnicities based upon African, Asian, New Guinea, uh, Australia, Europe, and so forth. And the base, the group which was outside of everybody else, was the Africans and that also had the most diversity. That, those two things were the important observations that led to the hypothesis we now call out of Africa which suggests that modern humans, as they populate the Earth today, six billion of us, share our origins with an ancestor, or at least a, a maternal ancestor, because mitochondrial DNA is only inherited through the, through the um, uh, maternal lineage, that lived in Africa some time ago. And the time that it came out was calibrated with fossils and with other kinds of ways, and it came out to be maybe 50,000 years ago, something between 40 and 70,000 years ago. That meant that if it was right, what Wilson was suggesting and the Out of Africa hypothesis claims is that even though there were primates, Homo species like Neanderthals, even Homo habilis, in Europe and in across Asia before that time. Well, those people got replaced with the migrants that came out 50,000 years ago, the out of Africa people. That was 30 years, 40 years ago, he came up with this idea. <clears throat> and a simple depiction of this is simply that anatomically modern humans about 50,000 years ago migrated out of Africa and somehow got to Asia, Europe, and then also stayed in Africa. And <clears throat> the journey, as illustrated by this National Geographic Society map, simply says that this migration took place and it led to the peopling of Europe, and it led to the peopling of Asia, it led to the peopling of Australia, and then it also led to the founders of the Native Americans that migrated through the Bering or Beringia Straits up here in Alaska, 
down through North America with a couple of migrations into South America. That's the simple version of it that has been around for about 30 years. What's changed? Well, a few things. I can't help but show you something that I thought was kind of interesting. Not about humans, but on another species that tended to reinforce the out of Africa idea, which is the leopard, which exists in Asia and Africa. One of my students actually did a study of leopards from all over the place, and what she found was that she got a tree which showed that the most primitive was the African, and then there was the Saxicolor from the Middle East and the Cotinia and so forth. And the date of the migration or the thing also came back to be about 70,000 years ago. So the way this was interpreted is that leopards, not humans, had their origins, at least the ones up north, had their origins in Africa something like uh, 50, 60,000 years ago, migrated up north, settled in the Near East, settled in India, settled in Sri Lanka, went over to the uh, Far East and Southeast Asia, on to Java, up north, and then up to the Japanese, which is the uh, um, Orientalis, which is the uh, uh, Russian Far East uh, Amer leopard, so less. All right, why am I showing you this? What does this have to do with human origins? Well, it meant that whatever drove the people north, the leopards went with them about the same time. What did drive them north? Well, we know now that there was a pretty cold period between 40 and 60,000 years ago, a ver veritable ice age up north. Well, kind of looked like Loretto this week, you know, really kind of chilly and difficult to get around. And of course it wasn't like that in Africa, so why did they leave? Well. I wasn't there, and neither were any of my colleagues, but they're guessing that because the glaciation was low enough in, Asia, in uh, Eurasia that it dried out a lot of the savannas down here in Africa, and there was a drought. The number of populations dropped, and the people were migrating out because they just were looking for food. They were looking for places to eat. That's the best guess. There's a lot of other more complicated guesses, but that's the common one. All right, so forth. So, all of this started out with Alan Wilson's mitochondrial DNA, but since then there have been other markers that have been kinds of markers that have, have gone to look at them. One are microsatellites, which are the short stutter repeat segments that are found in 200,000 copies in the genomes. They evolve rapidly too because they made mistakes. These are the markers that are used in forensic studies now to identify individuals in forensic cases. We'll talk about that in one of the lectures about forensics later on. Copy number variations also follow a time-dependent pattern. Mitochondrial DNA, I told you about, it's a 16,000 base pair chromosome. Most normal chromosomes, well, they're 100 million base pairs lot bigger, okay? So now that we have whole genomes, we can talk about the whole thing. And then the Y chromosome. This is, has an advantage too. Like mitochondria, which just tracks female lineage, the Y is only inherited from father to son. So as such, it doesn't reshuffle variation and it, demorate, and it generates what are called haplotypes, which is stretches of markers that are stuck together because they happened on a particular chromosome that had the background that it had. And as they accumulate, you can draw trees around them too. So the Y chromosome guys actually were very happy because the Y chromosome only had maybe 50 genes on it altogether. And they had variants in nearly all of them that built these haplotypes that could be tracked. They also have a number of hereditary diseases on the Y chromosome, such as, you know, uh, the uh, short stature and uh, reproductive abnormalities, retinitis pigmentosa. But basically, the genetic anthropologists, they were interested in the DNA variants they could track. So, and they would notice that if you started out, for example, with a proteic, okay, I guess I better plug this sucker in. 
Hold on. All right, there's probably a plug here. Seem to work. Ah, there it goes. Okay, thank you. Aha, okay. Now, we still got a little time. So, the Y chromosome that this guy had had a bunch of variations surrounding it, and then he might get another one and lead to another one, and then he might get another mutation. And this mutation would go extinct because he didn't have enough sons, or one of these guys didn't, and so forth. So, one of them might survive all the way and show up, and these are the ways they track the migrations by looking at the stepwise accumulation. So doing that, the Y chromosome was particularly informative because it turned out that the most primitive Y haplotype, the one that's found to be the ancestor of most of them, came probably from the sand people in Africa here. And the sand people are kind of a primitive culture that have this clicking language that you've seen them on television and plays there. They go talk like that all the time. And those people can be driven to a few steps that lead to a, a, a track across Europe, along across the, excuse me, the Saudi Peninsula, across uh, southern Asia, and then down to the most earliest migration was actually to the, some of the aboriginal peoples found in Australia. Okay, so that was the, what the Y chromosome told us. Uh, then there were all of these numbers are different combinations of alleles called haplotypes, and they've all been dated at a certain rate, where they came out of Africa about 50,000 years ago, and then they migrated into Australia, and then they migrated back up here into Southeast Asia, and then the purple ones, which are down here around 20,000 years ago, well, they tracked a the couple of migrations of the Native Americans that came over in North America and then down into South America. So this is how they got to that point. And then <coughs> Cavalli had ideas about what was going on based upon blood groups and other things that were similar but not quite right. Now, then something happened, well, first of all, the Bio, genome biodiversity natural human history community is pretty big. There's about 100 labs that think that they're experts on it. My lab is not an expert on it. I'm just telling you the story, okay? Uh, but I know these guys, and I love to listen to them pontificate and hypothesize about things that were going on when they weren't here. So these are a couple people, though, who have risen to the top. Uh, Sarah Tishkoff, she is a professor at Penn. Next year, if I come back, I'll get her to come. She's done a lot of work on African individual groups. She quantified the amount of pigmentation in people in all these groups and then looked at the genes that are known to be responsible for melanism. There's about three of them, and there's eight different mutations, and was able to demonstrate that the admixture and the mating and the transgression between these groups was so complicated as to be as mixed up 20,000 years ago as it was today in Africa, meaning that the great diversity and differentiation that you see in Africa isn't because they always lived in one place. 
It just happens to be that more recently they haven't been mating together. If you go back 20,000, 40,000, 60,000 years ago, they were all shuffled up and in different places as well. So Sarah taught us all that. This guy, Savante Pabo, is a Swedish citizen who was very interested in <coughs> ancient DNA. He was a student of Alan Wilson's at Berkeley, and he basically, for his PhD thesis, was able to extract DNA from a 4,000-year-old <coughs> mummy, a baby, and what he got was some sign element. It was, I mean, it was a big achievement technically, but it was useless information because it was part of the, part of the uh, repetitive elements. But he went on to form a laboratory in Leiden, Germany, which has become the center for developing what's called ancient DNA technology. And ancient DNA technology is undergoing a revolution in explaining how the simplistic things I just told you the last few minutes ago, or the last 20 minutes, are probably all wrong. Because of the mathematics has gotten better, the algorithms have gotten better, that is the mathematical algorithms. And one thing you should all understand as undergraduates is that in the days when I was a student, postdoc, young professor, well, you went to the laboratory, you generated data, and you analyzed it on a piece of yellow legal pad or something like that. Today, that's not the way it works. It's all about big data, and the big data is coming off of our machines in ways that you just cannot believe. So you have to write algorithms and then have the programs analyze them. It's sort of like doing surgery on the prostate gland from the moon on the moon with a you know, writing script. And that's why bioinformatics is so important. Because if you're going to get into genetics or genomics in the future, there's no way you can do it without knowing programming languages and knowing how to handle big data. You can say it's exciting. You can say, oh, boy, that was a good story. And when I saw this on TV and I read this book, it's all about handling big data and all about being able to move it around yourself and not wait for some bioinformatics guy who does know how to do it to come and help you out. So think about that. Now, Savante, on the other hand, he really made a career out of identifying ways to come up with getting DNA from fossils. And so because you get these little fossils all the time, well, they don't always have much DNA. It turns out that there's a little bone inside the inner ear that has 10 times more DNA in it than any other part. So if you can get that from your skeleton, bingo. Why is ancient DNA so tough? Well, first of all, the older it is, the more likely it is the DNA is all gone. It's just decayed. So what you need to do is you need to get it from a place where it's stored properly, and the best place for that is the permafrost in northern Russia or Canada or places like that where the mastodons and the mammoths lived and people lived too that hunted them, and to get out those DNAs from them. So today, ancient DNA extraction, assessment, and validation, which is all of what ancient DNA is, and bioinformatics is all about validation too, because there's a lot of artifacts. These have been really led by Svante and his colleagues. And <clears throat> one of his colleagues is this guy, David Reich. Now, David Reich is now a professor at Harvard Medical School. I first met him when he was a graduate student at Oxford, and my wife and I and children were on sabbatical there. And he was a graduate student of David Goldstein, who was himself a student of Luca Cavalli Sforza. And they were very interested in human diversity. And uh, <coughs> they, David started out as a mathematician. And then he bounced around. He thought about going to medical school. This guy, he thought about going to medical school. He studied biochemistry for a little bit. He worked with me 
on a project that fascinated me, which was how to date the age of a new mutation that we had discovered that was responsible for causing complete resistance to HIV AIDS. It was called CCR5. I'm going to give you a talk that mentions that later on in the thing. But David was the one who came up with the equation which allowed me to make that calculation. And then he went to Harvard. He went to, he was a postdoc with Eric Lander. Then he, then, but he decided that he was going to build an ancient DNA lab that was a factory that could produce it, could produce a lot of good DNA. So he did. And I would say that in 2010, when the Neanderthal genome was first sequenced um, by Pabo's group, there were four ancient DNAs. Five years later, or 2015, it was like 40. And this year, in David Wright's book, Who We Are and What They Are, this is a story of the revolution of ancient DNA in human history. It's now over 3,000 human genomes <coughs> whose ancient DNA have been used. And these have told us an awful lot. <coughs> They've told us that the, the migrations that were going on specifically were pretty much true. They told us that in Europe, when the anatomically modern humans arrived from Africa, they encountered the Neanderthal and they interbred with them. And now the survivors of that, the Asians and the Europeans, carry in their DNA anywhere from 2 to 5 percent DNA, which is explicitly from Neanderthals. Neanderthals went extinct 40,000 years ago. There's all kinds of stories about, well, these uh, modern humans went in and they just killed them all. Well, they, they might have just killed them all, but it took them 2,000 years to do it. And while they do it, they did a lot of interbreeding. <laughs> with them. So there was some breeding. And there was another group there. Uh, when they interbred, you could tell that. When you take, for example, the Neanderthal DNA from chromosome 12, this picture is from David's book, it basically has uh, markers distributed throughout which are unique to Neanderthals that are not found in any others. And when you look at DNA from a modern Siberian guy, well, this guy's got maybe eight or ten percent clustered together because they are pretty much closer. If you look at a Chinese guy, they've got about the same amount. And if you look at another fossil, which was younger, maybe 20,000 years ago, it has more Neanderthal. So the dark spots are just Neanderthal markers on the chromosome of the hundred million markers. There's, you know, uh, as I said, about between one and five percent. So basically, we can quantify how much Neanderthal DNA is in there. How many of you have had your DNA tested at 23andMe? There you are, OK. Did they tell you you were Neanderthal? Any? See, they don't usually tell you that. So the out of Africa route has now been rewritten with many different migrations, with Y chromosomes, ancient DNAs, migrations across, and so forth. And it's being argued about a lot. But one of the things that the ancient DNA revolution has told us is that the simple idea of a linear tract and changing in certain areas is probably simplistic because these people were always moving around. For example, it was 50,000 years ago that these migrations took place. And they took place, and they went around here, and then some of them went over to, to uh, North America. But as recently as 5,000 years ago, this place was occupied by the modern Europeans that had basically descended from these migrations from 40,000 years ago. And they had in it the, but then there was a big migration from Ukraine and southern Russia and the Far East, where they simply eliminated all these people. And these, these so-called Far Eastern people, they were the founders of the modern Indo-European Indo languages. They were the founders of the Indo-European dialect and their DNA. And it's all come out 
uh, looking at the pattern of DNA in present day French, British, Swedish, and so forth. So even though modern Caucasians look pretty homogeneous, that is the Europeans, they came from a wearing blender of historic populations, specifically from Eastern Asian founders about 5,000 years ago. So a lot of the simplistic ideas we used to think about kind of went away. One of the things that has been going on before ancient DNA came along was there was a movement stimulated a little bit by the Human Genome Diversity Project led by Americans and Europeans to sequence a lot of people and make them public on the webs. And there are now in the Thousand Genomes Project 2,504 people who are from the U.S., from South America, and so forth. However, there's a couple of places that have nobody. One of them is Russia. About 2012, I retired from the National Cancer Institute, National Institute of Health, which was wonderful to me. They basically supported many, many opportunities. I trained dozens of great students. I was involved in lots of different exciting things. You'll hear about some of them in the coming lectures. And I kept getting offered chair of this department and that department, usually in the Midwest, with weather like this, which I don't want to do. I was looking for an adventure. So one of the things I was offered was to come to St. Petersburg, Russia by a colleague of mine who had organized a big amount of money to help train programmers in Russia to become bioinformaticians in medical aspects of it. So I said, and he asked me if I want to come over and do that. And I said, yeah, that sounds like an adventure. I think I'll try that. So I went over there. I met some wonderful people, some terrific programmers, better than anybody I ever met in NIH. You know the Russians are good programmers, right? Okay, well, they are, <laughs> okay? And they really know how to do. So I said to him, I said, well, I think you're going to have to stop breaking into the Democratic National Committee and into the banks and into some of the government offices. And if you do that and you keep straight that I'll train you in medical bioinformatics, genome bioinformatics, and there's a huge market for your services throughout the world, including in America, including in Europe. So that was the beginning of the center that I started in 2012. About three years later, some of them and a couple of colleagues, one guy from the Ukraine, we decided, well, you know, they've got all these genomes from everywhere, but you know, and we know that everybody migrated through Russia. Why don't we uh, start a Genome Russia project to, to sequence Russians? So we kind of did. Here's what other countries that have got it. These are countries that I'm going to show you with circles now who have national projects. The United States has a project to sequence a million people. Canada has a project. You, okay, so the United States, there's UK. There's Iceland, Canada, and so forth. Lots of countries, like 40 countries that have genome projects. Russia was just started two or three years ago. We, st we called the project Genome Russia. I'm telling you this because some of the things that we found were kind of interesting. Our original study was to look at people in these little circles from throughout Russia that have names after the ethnic groups, and altogether, we started with 264 people, 55 minorities, and each one of these two-letter codes represents a different minority. Russia spans 11 time zones. It's 10 percent of the land's, world's land mass. It has a lot, it has almost 300 named ethnic groups. Everybody that migrated on, to some place went through Russia, but we have no modern genome sequences. So what we tried to do was to start this project up over there. I won't tell you a lot about it because we don't have much more time. 
but I am going to spend five minutes mentioning something that was kind of fun, which is mining for mutations that we knew about, such as in the human genome uh, mutation database. There's about uh, 80,000 mutations we know about and maybe 2,500 genes that these mutations are responsible for or have been associated strongly with some of the medical genetic diseases that we know about. How many of these do we find with our bioinformatics studies in Russian people and in different Russian people? Then there was something called loss of function SNPs. There's a way to look for nonsense uh, mutations in the middle of genes for uh, frame shifts that alter the coding and so forth, whether they give you SNPs or insertions, deletions, and copy number variations. And the second thing was we wanted to have Russia join the Thousand Genome Project so that they would, everybody would be saying, what's the matter with them? So I'm helping them do it. In fact, I retired from being the director of that, of that center a few, a month ago, specifically so that the Russians could run it. I'm still on their advisory board, so I'll go over there once in a while. But medical mining is the genetic load on peoples. There's a number of mutations that we know about that have vastly different frequencies in different countries that we knew about before we got involved. There's deafness alleles. There's lactose intolerance. I'll talk about that in a second. Alcohol toxicity. There's a big difference. The, the uh, uh, Japanese and Chinese have mutations in alcohol dehydrogenase, which if they drink too much, drink two drinks, they flush and turn red. So cheap dates. <coughs> uh, sickle cell disease, I'll talk about that in a minute, cystic fibrosis, and so forth. These are just some of the genes we know about, which have risen to high frequencies in certain uh, countries. The reason that they rise is because the mutations that cause these diseases often have another effect that makes them better. For example, sickle cell disease is a nasty genetic mutation that occurs predominantly in African people. It kills 100,000 children in Africa every year, and it causes the, the blood cells to see if I have a picture here. I do someplace. Yeah. It causes the blood cells to become sickle. They clog things up. These people get uh, oxygen depleted, which gives them tremendous muscle pain, and often they, they die before they're adults. It's just a nasty disease. Um, when we looked at the Russians, we found at least four mutations that had a very high frequency of diseases in a couple of places. Uh, the two places that we had large samples were a place called Pskov and another called Novgorod. These were in <coughs> Western Europe near Moscow and St. Petersburg. And the other one was in a, uh, Siberia in Yakutia, and it is Yakuts people. These are thought to have been originated from Near East founders uh, uh, thousands of years ago. And so we had whole genome sequences from 264 people, and we mined them for uh, mutations that we knew caused disease, such as these. And these were found in frequencies between seven and 300 times higher in either Yakutia or in the Piskov Novgorod than they're found in the other one. So there are big differences that have taken place recently. Then there are loss of function SNPs that were determined from mining all 20,000 variants, and you see these, and that's kind of interesting. And then there were four genes that I'm going to illustrate here for a second that showed big differences. One, which is involved in lactose intolerance. What's lactose intolerance? Well, about 10,000 years ago, when the hunter-gatherers that were roaming around Europe before the migration from the Far East 10,000 years ago, way before the 4,500-year migration. Well, they settled down in a place called the Fertile Crescent in the Near East. This is in near Saudi Arabia and Israel and thereabouts. And they started to do something very different, which is they gathered the, the wheats and the, the wild grasses and they domesticated, they bred them together in order to make food. 
And they also took the animals like the pigs and the, and the cows and some of these and, 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 and other species and then domesticated these. There's a whole lecture on domestication, but suffice it to say that 10,000 years ago we know that in the Middle East domesticated started with these first farmers. One of the things that happened was when the weather got cold, especially when they migrated north, <clears throat> they were shortage of food. Before they did that, the default genotype was a gene that specifically switched off the tolerance for milk when people hit adolescence. But a new mutation occurred there that all of a sudden became favorable because as they moved north, these people were dependent upon cows and dairy products to live. And the people who couldn't digest it as adults, they would starve to death or they had some very strong pressures. So this is the most strongly selected gene in the human genome. It has the strongest statistical signature of selection, lactose intolerance. It came up to be 90% lactose tolerant among Caucasians. So the frequency of lactose intolerance in some of these places is, is kind of interesting. It's, it's, it's all intolerant in blue and tolerant in the green. And of course, U.S. and, and, and North America is all because of the, is because of the migration from uh, after 1776. So basically, lactose intolerance is a very good example of differences that have occurred. So when you look at lactose intolerance among Caucasians, Finnish people, and then East Asians, which are Chinese people, the different frequencies are light blue and green. You can see they're quite different. Well, in Yakutsk, it's exactly the same as the East Asian, but in the eastern part of Russia, excuse me, western part of Russia, it's basically about half and half, even though these people are all thought to be European founders. So these were the founders, and this is what they look like now. So it's basically characterizing the frequency of damaging or helpful mutations. Warfarin resistance is another thing. This is a, a, a blood clotting, uh, anti-blood clotting uh, drug that's very common for people who have, are prone to heart attacks and, and heart disease. The frequency in Europe and Finland is a, uh, looks like this, but in you, you go to over here in uh, uh, East Asia, it's like this, and it's similar in Yakut. Skin pigmentation, this is one of the genes that causes melanin, dark skin protection. It's 98% you know, on the white people in, in uh, Europe and in Finland, and it's also that with Piskov and Novgorod in Russia. But over here, it's much darker in uh, China, Southeast Asia, and it's similar in Yakuts, where they were founded from. So these are the kinds of differences that you see in different ethnicities, but also locally within the Russian population. Let's see if there's anything else. Oh, sickle cell anemia is actually something that has been different, and I wanted to just mention that there's some promise about this now. I first heard of sickle cell anemia in the 50s when it was out in uh, textbooks by human genetics. They talked about it. They said, well, sickle cell anemia is a bad thing to have. However, carriers, heterozy it's a homozygous recessive disease. So it takes two copies of this mutation in the hemoglobin gene to get it. But if you have one copy, you're actually strongly associated with resistance to malaria. So it grew up in Africa because the heterozygotes were favored uh, because they were resistant to malaria. And so the basically where we're at now is they come to the United States where there is no malaria and they have tens of thousands of youngsters, African American mostly, that wind up with this crappy disease. Well now there's interesting, uh, shall I say, developments in gene therapy that are being used to treat this that have had amazing success. There's about a dozen clinical trials going on with sickle cell anemia doing one of three ways. First, you should understand that hemoglobin uh, containing red cells are made in a very short four or five day period after the stem cells that are in the bone marrow and then in the spleen 
get into the uh, circulating uh, uh, blood. And that's difficult time to get at them. So what these guys have done is they've taken the stem cells out of the um, bone marrow, which are the precursors of red cells, and then they differentiate them, uh, excuse me, then they treat them somehow. And there's three different ways they do it. One is they use uh, vi viruses that carry genes, usually defective adenovirus or HIV, and they put in a functional hemoglobin gene, and then they deliver it to the bone marrow in the laboratory and then put it back in the patient. And that's shown a lot of promise. Then there are, are actually two kinds of hemoglobin. There is a fetal hemoglobin and an adult hemoglobin, and the switch takes place at birth. So what they're doing is they're trying to block the switch in the stem cells so that the fetal hemoglobin continues in these children until uh, throughout life. And that's working too. That's working pretty well. And then you've all heard of CRISPR, which is this technology for gene editing and replacing a gene you don't like or a gene you want to replace. And that's being done, too, with hemoglobin, again, in the stem cells. So the breakthrough is use the stem cells. The approach is retroviral vectors, which are viruses containing a gene, stem cell uh, then, uh, drugs and inhibitors that block the fetal adult hemoglobin switch, and then CRISPR editing. Okay, these are just some stories. These are some of the indigenous groups that live down there. Uh, I don't think I have time to tell you this story, but let me just mention that Tay-Sachs disease and uh, fish oil consumption have been redefined lately in the sense of why they're so high in terms of Tay-Sachs. It looks like it's because they might provide resistance to tuberculosis. In terms of the Greenland Inuits, it's because they specifically uh, have a gene that allows them to metabolize the fat in the fish oil that nobody else has. This is important because there's three million Americans taking fish oil probably isn't helping them at all. <laughs> okay, these are just a, one of Sarah Tishkoff's slides where she demonstrates that uh, the parts of the world that have high frequencies of these things. And so there's a whole story about adaptation and selection for genes that are good for you in one way and bad for you another. And that's kind of what I wanted to get to. Looking way back in the evolutionary past, we will talk next week about some of the timetables and so forth. We know that one of the dominating uh, groups in, our li in, in the Earth's lifetime were the dinosaurs, well, under their feet were living the precursors of mammals, these little ro rodent-tied sized insectivores, this guy here, which led to the mammalian radiations. And then who are we are? Well, this is where we are today, and I've tried to give you a little flavor of how the whole field of human diversity has come about and what we've been able to do in just a, a few minutes. So the Genome Russia people are listed right here. Th these are people from St. Petersburg that I have worked with. This is me, and then the, this is uh, all the kids. And thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take a few questions if you have time.
questions? Right. Well, we'll go ahead and close. Let's thank uh, Dr. Brian again. <laughs> Hope to see you again Thursday for the next talk.